It's SOM, S-O-M-M, which is short for sommelier. Uh, it was also, uh, let's see, I guess it was featured at the Napa Film Festival. That was back in November, I believe. And uh, has really received just uh, high acclaim. What the movie features on, features is, focuses on, is what I meant to say, is a group of, in this case, all guys, uh, trying to work their way through the court of master sommeliers so they can be one of fewer than 200 people in the world that hold that title. It is not an easy challenge, and one of the gentlemen who was featured in this movie uh, is now taking his skills to Santa Barbara, where he will uh, open... Cavo, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Cavo in Santa Barbara, which will be a uh, tasting room and wine shop. Uh, Brian McClintock joins us on the line right now. Brian, welcome to the Eat, Drink, Explore radio program. Top of the morning, guys. Great to be here. Likewise. Uh, So ever since this movie has come out, have you been surprised at the amount of uh, attention and to some level fame you've received from this movie? I don't, I don't know about fame, but yeah, the attention is great. Um, we are opening, what, what is it, June 21st now in theaters throughout the country. So uh, it's very, very exciting um, to see all the notoriety it's been getting. It's been great. Yeah, the uh, it was picked up by a distributor, and I knew it was going to open soon. I didn't realize it was going to be that soon. So just a, what, a week from now. Yeah. Yeah, so it's coming out. We just actually finished up a premiere that we did at Montage Laguna Beach last night, which was really fun. It was a little private screening. Oh, um, how fun. And that was that was great. Yeah, I'm sitting here on my patio enjoying the nice view. Oh, I love Laguna um, Beach, <laughs> and I'm sorry that we made you get up so early. I, I imagine it was a fun event. <laughs> there is no sleep for sommeliers, Randall. <laughs> no, <laughs> apparently not. <laughs> <laughs> so this is, yeah, this is great. Um, but no, the, the film has been doing really, really well, and, and I'm couldn't be prouder for the director jason wise who's just done a great job with the film so excited yep. to see what happens we had jason on the program uh, back in when was that it was months back it was when, oh it was right before the san luis Obispo film festival i think you're right yes, yes. right yes and uh it was nice to have him on and talk about it as well yeah so now that you're getting all this attention um is this leading to some uh opportunities for you well um it's been actually great for our you know, our shop, which is up and running just about the same time as the theater release. So our store up in Santa Barbara is going to be um, up and running at the end of the month. And so to have the film going on simultaneously with that is, is definitely good for business. That's good yeah. timing. Mm-hmm. Brian, there's an article that you're also featured in. Is it in Food & Wine? Yeah, Food & Wine uh, right. magazine. And uh, I just stumbled upon it because Anthony, who does our audio, last night uh, I went to get a haircut from him as well. Uh, and he's like, hey, did you see this? Uh, I think you're featuring this guy tomorrow. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, oh, what? Yeah. And so uh, wh- how did it word it, Patty, in the article that uh, passing the uh, master sommelier test is like? He like the, the, the author likens it to passing the bar if you had to eat the paper that the bar exam was written on and then determine the trees where it was grown and all of that that the paper was pulped from so right. does that sound accurate brian I, i've got nothing but the highest respect for lawyers and to tell you that to pass the bar exam just sounds like the most tasteful thing on earth to be but it's a it's a it's a test that combines a lot of skill sets and i think that's the tricky thing if you're just like a bookworm and an egghead you know what i mean i think they have problems with the more um, social or intuitive aspects of tasting and service and stuff. But if you're just completely intuitive and stuff, then uh, oftentimes those people struggle when it comes to theory and, you know, hitting the books. So um, you got to kind of, you know, fire on all cylinders to pass this thing. Now, your new place, Cavo, am I pronouncing that correctly? You know, we actually had a name change. There was a oh. Cavo uh, wine bar in Denver. So oh. um, in order to respect their business, uh, we we felt it best to change the name, so it's actually Le Marchand now. Le Marchand, which means the merchants. Okay, oh, and okay. then oh, I like that. Uh, I'm just writing it down here so that I you don't, don't forget. Of course, my pen runs out of ink. Uh, <laughs> oh, I got a new one here. Thanks, Anthony. Uh, and so uh, Le Marchand mm-hmm. is, will it still be the because we're showing a web address right now, cavosb.com. Does that stay the same? Right, that's going to forward you straight to our our new website, which will be like lemarchandwine dot com. So okay, good. Yeah. So uh, Le, at Le Marchand, uh how will you differentiate your 
wine bar from, you know, all here in California, the thousands, I would imagine, uh, the thousands of others that you are competing with? Well, that's a good question. You know, the whole concept for us started with um, kind of a Burgundian concept. My business partner, Eric Railsback, travels to Burgundy a lot. And there's this, uh, basically this retail shop in Chassagne Mont Roche that specializes in um, special cuvées, a lot of back vintage stuff, you know, rare and, and uncommon bottles that you might not find on the open market. So that's kind of the focus for us is like taking, you know, wines that people just don't see very often. You know, often you'll have a collector consign his cellar. So you get a chance to taste wines that you normally wouldn't be able to see or drink. So that's really, really exciting. Um, I think the focus is more on France, Austria, Italy, and Germany in terms of European selections. And honestly, in Santa Barbara, you don't see a lot of European focus at no, all. No, no. Um, the wine cask uh, was very prominent back in their heyday with doing that. Um, and so I think we want to kind of pick up the torch uh, and bring that back to Santa Barbara. The other thing we want to do is really highlight a lot of local domestic producers from the county who a lot of people don't know exist. You know, uh, Eric and I both make wine up in, you know, the Lompoc area, and we get to interface with a lot of these, you know, 27-something, 30-something winemakers who make like 50 to 100 cases, and I don't think a lot of people out there, even in town, know who they are. So it's a great opportunity for us to be able to, to share that with people. So, sort of hidden treasures, things that people yeah. don't really realize are, are around. That's interesting. You know, the article um, in Food and Wine that Randall and I were reading, you guys did some uh, tasting in the Lompoc Wine Ghetto. Is this one of those places you're talking about that a lot no, of people don't realize? No, that's absolutely right. The Lompoc Ghetto is great. So they, they're up to like, there's got to be, I don't know, 15 to 20 tasting rooms up there. And it's just like the most chill, like warehouse style. It's not like, you know, the Disneyland $65 million winery. <laughs> but it, it, it right. kind of has the California feel of, of what it would be like to, to go to Burgundy. And, you know, the people are just kind of farmers, you know. So it's a very simplistic approach to tasting. It's kind of fun, non-pretentious. And honestly, the, the winemakers in the ghetto, there's some fantastic producers in there. So... Uh, definitely worth the money. Go and some there. good stories, too. I, I actually have done some interviews there um, for the station that I work for. It's some really good stories. And you're in there tasting and you're t chatting and talking. You start to hear some of the people's, you know, what led them to be winemakers and, you know, sort of the things, the choices they've made. Uh, you can really pass a day sitting there listening. I'm sure you can. <laughs> <laughs> the wine makes it easier, too. <laughs> <Right>. Absolutely. <laughs> I have nothing but the utmost respect for, for winemakers having, you know, started a wine label and seeing the process from start to finish. It's one thing to do it, you know, when you're studying for a, an exam. Yeah. It's another thing to, to watch what these guys put themselves through on a, on a daily basis. Pretty amazing. So you actually have your own label then, and you'll have a wine shop and tasting room. And you're a master sommelier. Yeah, I'm trying to stack deck <laughs> <laughs> to keep myself busy. Um, yeah, we have, we have a wine project with Dustin Wilson, who's actually one of the other subjects. He's now the wine director at 11 Madison Park in New York. But me, him and I and Eric Railsback, my business partner, are together on this wine label called Valan, which actually we just bottled May 31st and have taken it to market. So 2012 is our first vintage, and it's a, kind of a Syrah-based project. We're really, really excited about our winemakers, Justin Willett from the great Tyler Wines, and couldn't have a better winemaker at the helm. Where are the grapes grown in the Santa Rita Hills, or? Yeah, so we're going to have different fruit sources this year, but for the first year, most of the the Rhone varietals came from Happy Canyon and Ballard. So the Syrah was from Kimsey, mm -hmm. which is a, a relatively young vineyard um, in Southwest Ballard, and then the the other fruit for Grenache and Marsan and Viognier came from. Uh, Camp Four in Happy Canyon and McGinley Vineyard. So Ballard's that really little town between Solvang and uh, uh, Los Olivos. Right, right. Yeah. It just became an AVA, so oh. hot, the ink is not dry on and Ballard. An, <laughs> and an AVA is a distinct region of growing that you can put on a label, correct? Absolutely. So American viticulture viticultural area. So it's too early. I can't say viticultural. <laughs> right. <laughs> That's okay. So uh, we are speaking with Brian McClintock, one of fewer than 200 master sommeliers in the uh, world today, uh, featured in the movie Psalm, coming to a theater near you. It is 944. When we return, Brian, I know you can't shove an in 
everything that you uh, experienced going through the, I don't know, months, maybe years to... Uh, Preparing for that master soleil yeah, test. Perhaps you can give us some tricks for tasting. I'll do my best. All right, stick around, everyone. <laughs> You're listening to the Eat, Drink, Explore Radio Network. We're back with tasting tips right after this short commercial break. Randall White here, host of Eat, Drink, Explore Radio, with a tip for Central Coast wine tasting. Eberly Winery was recently voted Winery of the Year by the world's top sommeliers and has one of the best local tours, according to Wine Spectator. Eberly Winery opened daily 10 to 6, and the winery's cave tours and wine tasting always complimentary. It's easy to find, too. Located on Highway 46 East, just three and a half miles from Highway 101. Now it's time to plan your visit. Just head to eberlywinery.com. Can we have your attention for a moment? Eat, Drink, Explore Media has an important date we want to share with you. Saturday, July 13th. We invite you to join us at a craft beer and food event like no other. At last count, generous samples from more than 70 breweries will be paired with local culinary treats for the 2013 Breast Fest along San Francisco's waterfront at Fort Mason. Going on its 14th year, the annual Breast Fest has grown dramatically, raising money for an incredibly important cause, providing free complimentary treatments for women battling breast cancer. The Charlotte Maxwell Clinic offers services such as acupuncture, massage, organic foods, and transportation. The clinic's core mission to provide relief from the terrible side effects of cancer and its treatments. Eat, Drink, Explore Media is very proud to be among the main sponsors for this year's event. For more information, go to thebreastfest.org. Randall White here, host of Eat, Drink, Explore Radio, with a tip for Central Coast wine tasting. Eberly Winery was recently voted Winery of the Year by the world's top sommeliers and has one of the best local tours, according to Wine Spectator. Eberly Winery opened daily 10 to 6, and the winery's cave tours and wine tasting always complimentary. It's easy to find, too. Located on Highway 46 East, just three and a half miles from Highway 101. Now it's time to plan your visit. Just head to eberlywinery.com. The Eat, Drink, Explore Media radio show you are currently enjoying is in a local affiliate commercial break. Live programming will return shortly. Did you know you can watch a live video simulcast of our Sunday morning and Thursday evening shows from your computer, smartphone, or tablet device? And to top it off, it's free. Simply head to eatdrinkexplore.com or download our free app from the Google Play or Apple App Store. If you have a suggestion for an upcoming guest segment, send an email to radio at eatdrinkexplore.com. We're always looking for fresh ideas, including yours. We love to share fresh, local, organic, seasonal, and sustainable ideas throughout the week. And the best place to find those are on our Twitter, YouTube, and Facebook feeds. Our username across the social networking universe is simple. Eat, drink, explore, all one word. Hey, college students, Eat, Drink, Explore Media is always looking for qualified journalism or marketing interns. Send us an email today so we can check your status and put you on the list for upcoming intern vacancies. Would you like to hear this Eat, Drink, Explore radio program on one of your local radio stations? Let the station know and contact us as well so we can get the ball rolling. Okay, you made it. The local affiliate commercial break is now over. Time for more informative and entertaining programming from Eat, Drink, Explore Media. Thank you for your patience. Welcome back to the program, everyone. 9.49, now the time. Our audio guy, Anthony, has us laughing because I (laughs) I left a a package of chocolate-covered almonds from uh, Catano Brothers on the... Where do you uh, get those, Randall? Dark chocolate Chipotle, and you get them all over the state. 
Uh huh. Uh, they're made uh, locally in San Luis Obispo, but they are delicious. They give you a little bit of spice kick at the end. A little end. sweet, a little crunch, yeah, a little in the back, salt. In the back of your mouth, you, like, at first you're like, I don't taste any chipotle. And then kind of creeps up on you. Yeah, and then all of a sudden you're like, oh, yeah, there it is. You know, mm-hmm. so uh, I left the bag right there in front of the audio console and uh, it's gone. It, it's gone. Yeah. <laughs> and he said, I have to stop eating these. And he holds up the empty bag. Yes, you do, because there do. are none left. Yeah, you don't, you don't have any other option. <laughs> no, no. So. Uh, welcome to the program, everyone. Great to have you with us. Uh, last segment, we were speaking with uh, Master Sommelier uh, Brian McClintock. He is opening a new place in Santa Barbara called Le Marchand. I hope I'm saying that correctly because I sounds do, good. Brian, I do not speak French, but I always try to fake it as best I can by <laughs> better drop, than I can pronounce it. Basically, I just drop the last like five or six letters of every word, and <laughs> <laughs> great policy right? <laughs> seems to work pretty well. Uh, but uh, yeah, uh, congratulations. First of all, uh, you passed the test of the Court of Masters Sommeliers, and it was uh, all documented in a movie, SOM, S-O-M-M, which comes out on the 21st of this month. Check the Art House Theater near you. I would imagine here in San Luis Obispo it'll play at the Palms. I would think so. Is my mm-hmm. guess. Uh, it, will it play there locally for you in Santa Barbara? I hope so. Uh, eventually, they've already been in talks to do it. So I think right now it's in the major markets in L.A., and for those people who um, can't really get down to L.A. in the interim. It's, it'll come out on iTunes on the same day, and then oh. as the first week goes by, the secondary markets will hopefully uh, pick up. So, yeah, yeah. I, very I, cool. I really think it, there's a very viable chance it'll come to the Central Coast. So. Our plan here is to uh, drive down the 101, and if it does open in a theater there, watch it, and then when we're done with the movie, head on over to your place. That sounds like a great plan. <laughs> I will not, have a glass waiting for you. Yeah, not... Not your bar. We're literally going to head over to your place. <laughs> no, I'm teasing. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, all right, let's talk. First off, how long does this whole process take? Like, you know, if you're going to get an MBA, you know, it's uh, six years, you know. So for for what you had to do, how long does that take? And then how long does the test take? Well, I think for the average, okay, so the, the exam is three days um, long, and you can only take it once a year. And oh. if you pass one part... Uh, you can keep that part, but you have three tries, in other words, three years to pass all three parts. If you don't, in three years, you lose all your parts. You're starting over. And start over, and I can't tell you how many times that happens. Yeah. So I think the, the average person, in all honesty, from, from level one, there's four levels of the exam, all the way to the master level is probably a seven to eight year process on average. I just want to point out when you say the average person who passes the exam, if you're talking about a pool of less than 200 in the world, is there actually an average person? There is no <laughs> average person, right? <laughs> yeah, we don't have a lot of numbers to make. Yeah, statistically make speaking, I'm not, extreme, I'm not sure that can technically be true. Right. <laughs> Good point, good point. I'll go back to my statistics. (laughs) So seven to eight years to get to that point, and then, uh, wow. And then, so, clearly, the average, in this case, there is an average person, the average person that goes to, uh, whether a restaurant, a wine bar, Mm -hmm. or even that goes out wine tasting at any of the many, many places throughout the state that you could do that here, uh, what are some of the aspects they should be looking for when that first, you know, glass of wine comes to their lips? Uh, what, you know, kind of walk us through it. Walk us through just kind of tasting tips. Yeah. Uh-huh. For the average. For, for the, the average, average person. Yeah. Not what you're looking for. <laughs> right. Honestly, the biggest hurdle I get with, with even most people um, is the intimidation factor. And mm-hmm. it's like the desire to hone your palate. I think a lot of people have a preconceived notion that like, oh, this guy's a master sommelier, or this guy knows a lot about wine. I could never be that. Wine is wine. I just, you know, put my nose in the glass, and all I smell is wine. Yeah. And I think that was my hurdle going in, and I get that question a lot. And What people ask me more than anything is, you know, can everybody hone their palate to be that sharp? And the answer, having gone through the process, is yes. I think this process more demystified a lot of things for me than it actually... Uh, you know, open Pandora's box, so to speak. So um, when you approach a wine, it's far more um, brain than it is anything else. You know, if I, we have a five-part assessment that we use in the court where we, you know, analyze nose, aroma, palate. You have an initial conclusion and a final conclusion. Someone hands you a glass of, let's say, red wine, and you look at that wine, and you can see your, 
your fingers out the bottom of the glass, it's a translucent red wine, well, you know it's a thin-skinned grape. And if you know which grapes are thin-skinned and which grapes are thick-skinned going in, you can eliminate a lot of wine. So Malbec, Syrah, Cab would, would be out of the equation at that point. You know, you look at the color and that tells you a lot. It can tell you whether the wine was made oxidatively or reductively. It can tell you whether it's old or young. So before you even put your nose in the glass, you're already making judgments about the wine. And, uh, you know, I guess the, the, the fascinating thing about it is, you know, everybody comes to the table, the average human being, with 10,000 smells that they innately can smell. And, and so when, when we recognize that as human beings, the talent is there. You know, it's just a matter of creating a language and understanding the theory of tasting more than anything else. I love that. I, it's fascinating. <laughs> P- Patty and I have interviewed so many different people, and I was wondering, what is he going to say that I, for me, that... Uh, you could actually put into work. Right, that I use. think, okay, there's something I haven't heard when it comes to tasting. <laughs> mm-hmm. And uh, you just did it. I had never thought that, like, looking to see your fingers through the wine, that's interesting to me. Yeah. Well, you know, I think in a lot of ways, ignorance is bliss, because at some point, you just want to turn that brain off and have a good time. <laughs> but, you know, for the cerebral part of us who just kind of, you know, have a quest for knowledge, you know, it's, it's a fun thing, and it's a fun game, and, it's, and really, it's not that intimidating to hone your palate and get better. Interesting. Do you, Brian, would you say that uh, men have better palates than women, or mm. it's vice just it's <laughs> vice versa? Yeah, I think women naturally, you know, like especially with like either perfumes or flowers, or whether it's like color swatches, you know, for paints and stuff. It's like they have an ability to analyze uh, uh, colors really well and know flowers really well and smells in general. I, I think women are far sharper than men when it comes to this stuff. So why is it disproportionately the other way around when it comes to the those few people that hold this uh, huge level of status among sommeliers? Well, you know, that's a very good question. I think this, this whole, the quartermaster sommelier started in the 60s in England, actually, and it was a bunch of guys who got together. And that's what it started, and it's, it's now become this a lot bigger thing than than a little boys club in England, you know what I mean? And so you have, especially at the lower levels, there's a huge, huge demographic of women that are entering the fray. Good. And a lot more master sommeliers now than there were five, ten years ago. So that number is changing, thankfully, and it's very, very exciting to see. Brian, thank you so much for being on the show today. Really, we could have gone a whole other segment. Uh, You're (laughs) you're fantastic, and I wish you the best of luck with all of your ventures. Thank you guys so much. Thanks for having me. And we'll see you soon, and we have links available at eatdrinkexplore.com for all of Brian's ventures. Make it a great day, everyone.